Hello, yeah, this is RL Ranch. Yeah. Hey, I got something interesting in the mail. A pair of cowboy spurs. What am I supposed to do with them? You're trying to spur me on, is that right? Hello, electronics enthusiasts and ham radio operators the world around. The subscribers to this channel are called Augies. If you'd like to become an Augie, just hit subscribe. And it really helps with the stats and all that kind of cool stuff. I have a question from Jordan Kurtz, an almost the identical question from Mark Rowell. Jordan is KE9BPO, and Mark is N7MHR. And they're both asking about spurs. Now, the first thing you think of when you think of spurs are cowboy spurs, okay? But the word spur means many things. In the case of radio, a spur is an unwanted signal that the radio itself generates. According to Google's AI, the two related terms, a spur versus birdie, they both refer to unwanted signals that we have and that can interfere with the desired radio reception or transmission. The idea of a spur or a birdie is something that is man-made, okay? This is not a natural phenomenon. While often used interchangeably, they're subtly different according to Google. Google's always right, what can I say? Okay, a birdie is generally associated with a receiver's internal structure, okay? It's just as you tune up and down the radio, you'll occasionally find just a, a single tone, okay? And this is some harmonic of an internal oscillator, or it could be that there is the oscillator creates its normal source, but it, it hits some sort of a bad connection between two pieces of metal or something like that, and it can create what's called intermod. These connections act like diodes, current flows more easily one direction than another. That's why you want to make sure these things are tight. And when it does that, it will take another radio signal, perhaps from the same radio, and you'll get not only the sum, but the difference of those two frequencies, and they'll show up as, as sine waves. This is a picture that uh, Jordan is showing, that he's listening and there are equally spaced tones on his radio. Now, a good source to look for these is that you have some sort of a nearby DC to DC converter that has a basic conversion frequency equal to the difference between these two. DC to DC converter does very rapid switching, and each switching uh, moment creates gobs of harmonics that can go well up into the RF range. It could be what you're looking at. If it's created by the radio itself, the way to find out is to run your radio on a battery, okay? So you don't have switching transients from something else. Take the antenna off. Now, tune around and see if you still have those signals. If so, they're probably created inside the radio itself. Now, I know, for example, the ICOM 7300 is a very fine radio, software-defined, and so it's hard to accidentally create extra lines like that. And so you would discover them as a result of some analog circuitry in, inside the radio. You will uh, discover that they are very, very low level, okay? Almost any signal, in fact, if you connect the antenna, you'll get enough RF noise that probably it'll swamp uh, the birdie. Now, all radios, all super heterodyne radios have birdies. Now, the, the idea is that spurs are undesirable characteristics. They often appear as continuous tones, chirps, squeals coming. Common sources are the VFO or the BFO microprocessors. Remember, microprocessors all have a clock. And switching power supplies in or near the radio. In some cases, even external devices like computer monitors and network gear can radiate signals that cause birdie. A spur is a broader term encompassing any unwanted component of a radiated or received signal. And they can come from the same kinds of sources. Like I said, the two are uh, used almost interchangeably. How do you get rid of them? Like I said, on all modern radios, 
they are usually extremely low level and if you bring in any HF signal at all it'll swamp them. Occasionally that's not the case and you just have a frequency that's going to have a tone on it and there's not much you can do about it. The higher quality radios as you go up into intermediate or high level radios take great effort to reduce those spurs and birdies. If you get a radio like 7300 which is a it's an entry to medium uh, radio. They're mostly gone. They're way down there because it's software defined. You can avoid the problem most of the time. But there's a clock for the microprocessor, which is a jagged signal. It's a square wave signal, okay, to clock the microprocessor. And to, that will have harmonics. And then those harmonics can mix with other tones in the radio. For example, the ICOM 7300 has an RF amplifier, analog RF amplifier at the beginning. So it's possible for an incoming signal to mix with some of those harmonics from the clock and you can get very faint birdies. They've gone way out of their way to try and make sure you don't have problems with that. I took the covers off the 7300 once just to look inside. It's built around a very sturdy, thick cast aluminum chassis. There's all these little compartments in there where they have various parts of the circuitry and they're very, very, very well shielded from each other. So that's why in the modern radios you keep it down. If you do a super heterodyne radio, of course you're getting image frequencies. If the image frequency mixes with another signal, like for example a clock for the microprocessor, you're going to get signals popping up in different places. Now the spurs can come from outside the radio. The reason I want you to connect your radio with a battery is so that you are not dealing with the DC to DC converter in the power supply. Okay, make sure that's turned off. If you are having a problem still, you can turn off all the power to the house. Listen, if the spurs have gone, turn on the switches one by one and see what may happen. You may find that you have a fluorescent light or a grow light or something like that that's creating extraneous RFI, radio frequency interference, which would cause a problem. So there you have it. Yeah, they are an artifact of the world we live in and some are generated inside the radio and you can see them when there's no other signal coming in. Now one last tip. If you are having trouble with RFI from in the house, what you want to do is make the nearest thing that the radio can hear be the antenna itself. Now the way you do that is by excellent grounding. Okay, you've got the ground rod outside, you've got your little single point ground inside the shack, they're all connected together, that all the antenna leads come down to a lightning arrestor that's very carefully grounded. This grounds the outside of the shield. And that way, and you've got good coax going from your radio down to the lightning arresters inside the shack. The way coax works, outside signals cannot get into coax unless they're extremely strong and you have poor coax. So go for good coax like RG8X, RG213, uh, LMR400, LMR240, uh, something like that that's very well shielded. And then that way, the antenna has to hear it for it to show up in your radio. And that eliminates a lot of the in-house interference that might get into that. It's one thing that grounding is very good for. The primary purpose of grounding is safety. Secondary is to eliminate different kinds of noise. It doesn't help your antenna hear better, but it does help your radio hear the antenna better. So there you have it. I want to mention something that we've just started. If you'd like to support this channel, go to patreon.com slash ke0og. If you sign up for the $2 level for your first month, we will send you a genuine legal currency. This is U.S. currency, $2 bill. Okay, these we don't see very often because most people don't use them, but they're perfectly legal tender. Anyway, if you join up at the $2 or higher level, we'll send you a $2 bill. And you can, I don't know, write Ask Dave all over it. So anyway, there you go. Until we next meet, 73.